Good day to you, dear beloved, and welcome to this video. Um, we will continue with our series about the mindset of people, uh, whoever they are, in terms of studying scripture and the mindset in general, as I have laid a foundation already in the previous videos. <coughs> so today, we are going to continue to look at some examples with regarding to mindset in studying scripture. So let's continue with the slides. We started with the um, example of the salvation of all, right? Here, salvation of all. <coughs> Excuse me, there is a uh, something in my throat. Anyway, the salvation of all, and we see how people want to either pursue the truth, and if it's true, the salvation of all, where can you find it? We, we went through some scripture verses and passages, but we also have seen how people, due to different circumstances and experiences how they uh, also want to find evidence to uh, to the to the effect that there is eternal torment and they to that to that uh, purpose they maintain mistranslations they maybe even deliberately <coughs> Uh, maintain misinterpretations because it doesn't suit their view, it doesn't suit their interests to change their stance on, let's say in this case, the salvation of all. Okay, so let's continue with another example, right? This time, a simple example of the prophets <coughs> In the Hebrew Scriptures, <coughs> salvation of a large city named Nineveh. Nineveh. So, an example of such an attitude can be found in the prophet Jonah, who is instructed by God to go to the great city of Nineveh to announce its demise. God would destroy that city with more than 120,000 20, inhabitants, mind you, after 40 days. <clears throat> Jonah, there's a whole story behind it. Jonah first tried to, he, did, he tried to flee from that uh, assignment. And uh, of course, God made sure that he landed right there at that city. So reluctantly, he did what was asked of him. You know the story, right? Thus, he was completely uninspired, completely. So that was a hell of a uninspired preaching right there, right? But the word of God, and it's not about the preaching as we know, it's about the working of Holy Spirit, God through Holy Spirit, and the word that Jonah uttered there touched everyone <clears throat> and the whole city the whole city repented even the king so in that sense Jonah should be happy right he should be he should be a happy guy in terms of my god my work here is not in vain so to speak yet Jonah hoped that god would still overthrow Nineveh and this is clearly as an example, an example of an unrighteous wish <clears throat> or even an unrighteous thought, what Jonah had. Can you see that? Can you also replace uh, that situation into this time in which we live? And we know whom we're talking about, right? Let's continue. <clears throat> So, I'm just using a paraphrase here. Jonah went out of town, bought himself first cla a first-class ticket and a bag of pop popcorn and cola, and he thought 
Now I'm going to enjoy a wonderful spectacle. How God is going to destroy Nineveh. Well, they shouldn't have been so sinful anyway. He might have thought in his unrighteous thinking. That sounds a little Christianese, right? Yeah, I know. But God spared Nineveh. He no longer carried out his judgment. And what do you think happened? You know the story. Jonah got angry. <clears throat> Again, he still hoped that the city would be destroyed. Whom does this situation make you think of? Of course, Christians in the main, in the main sense. Christians. They want some people to be destroyed forever. They want some people to be tormented without end. Think about that. That's what some Christians want. want. And they get angry when they hear that everyone will be saved ultimately. They get angry about it. Why? Because of their self-righteous thought. Their self-righteous mindset. They want to be a part of an exclusive group. A group that is better and higher than the stupid sinners who were so stupid not to accept Jesus and make the righteous choice. <coughs> this, is, this is the same situation right here. Maybe not exactly the same, but they also get angry when they hear about the salvation of all. Think about it. So, Jonah still hoped that the city would be destroyed. And that, of course, is an unrighteous thought. It's an unrighteous wish. Exactly what Christians are doing. What they have in their mind. Unrighteousness. <clears throat> and we will soon see where that leads to. So, is this recognizable? Yeah, it is human also. I was a Christian, I had the same unrighteous thoughts. I had the same unrighteous mindset about other people. Yes, I recognize it and I remember it. And it's humbling. And it helps and it makes grateful for God to <coughs> have called me and give me faith. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've all had that feeling at times, of course. The problem is that people want to maintain this sense of pseudo-superiority at the expense of the truth. That is the difference, relatively speaking, of course. Behold, that's exactly where it will go horribly wrong if they maintain it. Yes, of course. Let's read and it will come later in the study again. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11 and 12. We know that verse. Let's read it. And therefore, it's God who will be sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood that all may be judged who do not believe the truth relatively willingly so but delight in what in justice <clears throat> the wish of jonah that he hoped that the city would be destroyed is that injustice or not of course it is injustice is it injustice when you hope that People or some people, bad people in your eyes, bad people will be tormented day and night without end? Is that injustice? Of course it is injustice. It is taking a limited sin and punish that with an unlimited punishment, unlimited eternal torment. Think about it. That's injustice. They delight in it. Who delights in injustice? Christians do, especially Christians. 
in the, in in general it's also religious people but especially christians <coughs> okay so let's continue so the key is always relatively close if you think about it the key is close god always puts a key at the door always it's not that you cannot find it you cannot blame god for not being able to find the key he always puts a key and also you could say a key just beneath the surface not deep you don't have to dig deep you have to do a little something a little effort and that's it and that's also a way to often get to the truth quite easily if you're really focused on finding the truth and nothing else yes so i've listed some examples to make it somewhat clearer about this point this principle that the key is always relatively close let's take a look let's take a look at the word eternal for example think of all the places in scripture and it's a lot of places where the word eternally or sorry eternally or eternity or everlasting is mentioned suppose just place yourself in that situation and suppose you hear even a rumor a rumor about information regarding the true meaning of the the greek word ion or the word the, the adjective ionion which refers to a world era or world age with a beginning and an end the hebrew word by the way is olam olam same thing means world era or world age with a beginning and an end so if you even uh, as, as to hear a rumor about the the, 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 the the possibility that these words can mean something else than eternal, everlasting, etc. or eternity, then if you are pursuing the truth, you will investigate this immediately because you will think, hey, but this is very important. This is an important word. So you will go and look for it. What is the truth? What is the truth? Does it make sense if you place those translations as eternal, eternity, uh, everlasting? If you place those translations, does it make sense and be honest about it? So, and then you think of the translators, professionals, those translators' choice the choice they made to translate ion or ionian or olam into the word eternity or eternal or everlasting what is your thought your attitude then in that situation do you immediately put it aside as nonsense or do you listen eagerly and then immediately start investigating because you want to know what is the truth just the truth which one is it which one are you siding with the majority of the institution called church or are you going to investigate what is the truth no matter who believes it or not <clears throat> that's the question we continue with little effort then you will soon discover that it has been completely mistranslated and means something entirely different namely ion ion or eon you can tr tr uh, transliterate it also eon e o n this is a world era or world age that is relatively long with both a beginning and an end <clears throat> in which a particular world system 
or world order if you want, doesn't matter, applies and also is operational. <clears throat> that is what the world era or world age means. That's what an ion means. It's an era, again, in which a certain world system or order applies and operates. And a literal world system, literal. I'm not going to go in depth here because I have other videos on, in this on this channel where I explain what eon means. You can look for the word eon, E-O-N, and you will find uh, videos regarding that. And I go in depth uh, there in those videos about the meaning of eon. And it's very important, very foundational. So if you don't know that word, please take a look if you want to know the truth. Such a discovery brings about a totally different image and expectation of the living God and his genius plan, of course. And it makes you ponder and realize what often disastrous consequences this has had in the theology of Christianity. Because this is a biggie. This is huge. This word eternal, oh boy. This is a huge mistranslation. And it has been maintained by the institutions, <clears throat> by the established churches. That's the point. So think about it. Um, now I'm in doubt. I'm going to do one more slide. Why not? And I will start the next video with that slide. So <clears throat> another example of the fact that the key is relatively close. Sheep and goats. How about that? Remember that judgment? Let's take a look. Consider that judgment of the nations in Matthew 25 verse 32. Very, very well known judgment of course. If you read that passage somewhat indifferently, so very superficially, and later read about the sheep and the goats in that same passage, then you have forgotten that in the beginning of that passage, it was clearly stated that this concerns nations and therefore not individuals. Furthermore, with a bit of serious study, you will soon discover that it is not about the endless fate of the unbelieving individual, but it is about the location on earth during the thousand years, namely the fourth eon, the fourth eon, that's the millennium kingdom, of the nations that treated Israel either well, sheep, or badly goats. Again, this is about the location on earth of the nations during the millennial kingdom. Those nations that treated Israel well or badly when within the great, especially the great tribulation. You could say within the, the last week of Daniel, the 70th week. So, and of course, of which the second part is the Great Tribulation. So think about this. I'm going to end here. And then next video, I will start with this slide again. I thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.